Hey guys, uh, it's good to be here again uh, today to be able to continue our series on fear, uh, the change up, and how uh, not only does fear uh, pull a change up on us uh, uh, and make and fooling us, but also in a way that we can put a change up on fear and and change the way we view fear and the way we feel things and change it to embrace what is true. Uh, and that's really what the goal of this whole thing has been since we've started, as I really hope that as we go through these times and we talk about these different stories of the Bible and we look at some funny videos and those different things, that what you come away with is that there are lots of things that we may feel, but just because we feel them doesn't make it true. And that's the one of the main things that I want to get across as we talk about fear. Fear convinces us that our feelings are more important than what's actually true. Uh, and, and this happens to all of us. I think we've all had experiences, and I think right now during this quarantine, uh, and who knows when we'll be breaking out of it, but during this whole time, we feel a lot of things. You know, we might feel lonely, we feel incapable, we feel uh, fearful. Uh, you fill in the blank, you, we are fe we're feeling different ways. And sometimes the problem is, is those fears control how we live. And that's what I don't want us to do. As Christians, knowing Jesus, we don't need to let fear control us because it really doesn't have any control. We only let it have control. We need to let Jesus control our lives. And that's what we're going to continue to talk about. This is the fourth week. This is the final week in the Change Up series as we talk about fear. I want to do a little bit of review, maybe remind you where we've been. First week we talked about when we feel fear. We need to turn away. We need to change things up from saying, I'm afraid, to instead saying, um, he loves me. It, turn away from saying, I'm afraid, to he loves. And we talked about this idea that when we feel the most afraid of what's going on in our life, we need to remember the love of God. We need to remember that he loves us so much that he gave us Jesus to die for us, to, to give us everything we needed. And we remember that love, and that should help us when we do feel fear, so that we don't over, be overcome by it, and we don't start living in ways that we shouldn't by freezing or running or fighting or yelling, all of those things we talked about, but instead that we would be embracing Jesus and looking to his love. Uh, so we talked about that the first week. Uh, the next week, uh, we talked about the, the basic idea of making excuses because we're afraid. We talked about Moses at the burning bush, uh, and we, learned, we, we wanted to move from uh, change it up from saying, I can't, to saying he will. I can't is not what we should be saying, but yet that's what fear wants us to say. I can't do what God is asking me to do because I'm not good enough, or I can't do it the way that he wants me to, or he's got it wrong. But we're told in scripture that because he's with us and he will do things through us, that we can pull the change up on fear. We can not be afraid and we can do what we're meant to do as we follow him. And then last week, and uh, I hope you were able to watch that one. If you haven't, I would go back and watch that one because I think that one is one of the most applicable ones to where we find ourselves today. And we looked uh, at uh, one of God's prophets. We looked at Elijah, and we looked at the fact that he had this great big moment where he had this huge defeat over a false god and all of the, its prophets. And then he goes and he runs away because he's afraid because Jezebel wants to kill him. And he goes up and into a cave and his general feeling was this, I'm all alone, what else do I have to live for? That was his feeling. Maybe you felt that during this quarantine. I can almost guarantee you have, because I have. We get to this thought that we're all alone and nobody's around us. We don't have anyone to care for us. We're just alone. And we believe that lie. Fear tells us that uh, you're. we're afraid that no one is around and we're afraid that we're alone. And he reminded Elijah, God did, uh, that he wasn't alone, that God was with him first and foremost, but also that there were many other people who were following God with him. And so the reminder last week was when fear tries to tell us that we're alone, remember that we're not alone. Put the change up from feeling loneliness and saying, I'm alone, to changing it to say, he's with me. And we remember that he's with me and others are with me. Remember, we're in this together, even though we're not physically with one another, we're in this together. So those are the first three weeks. Now we're into the fourth week. We're going to talk about the last way that fear tries to pull a fast one on us, that tries to make a change up out on our lives, that fear will try to convince us of something that's not true. And here's what it's going to be. Whereas last week we talked about fear leads us to think that we're alone. This week we're going to look at the fact that fear actually might make us think that 
we deserve to be alone. That there's a difference in that. You know, understand what I'm saying. One way we fear, I think I'm alone. The other way is saying, well, yeah, I kind of deserve to be alone. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. And so I don't really, I'm not really worthy of God's love. I'm not really worthy of other people's love. And so I deserve to be alone. That's a very dangerous place to be. And that's where fear wants us to get. Um, so we're going to start with a video today as kind of a way of illustration as we get started. Uh, one of the main ways that many of us, if you've experienced this, have felt unlovable and you've felt like no one wants to be around you or no one cares about you is through a breakup. Now, I don't know who that's watching this has undergone a breakup. Maybe you've had a boyfriend or a girlfriend that uh, you've had to deal with a breakup. And I'll tell you, I understand when this happens, you feel like you're unlovable, that no one's ever going to love you again. Uh, and you can get depressed and angry and sad and fear can convince you that, well, since this relationship worked, none, no relationship will work. But maybe you haven't experienced a breakup yet. Maybe it will still come. Maybe for some of you, uh, you might not ever have to face a breakup. I, I hope that's true. Uh, I actually never have. Um, I've had a few rejections, but I've never had a full breakup. But just in case you do find yourself in a place where you're going to experience a breakup, or maybe you've already experienced one, I'm going to show you this video on how you can handle and how you can survive a bad breakup. So with that, why don't you take some time to watch this video and then we'll come back and talk about it. college a better way. Go to getunbound.org slash cow to get a free quote. Isn't love wonderful? Aren't new relationships fun? Remember the first time you ever met your significant other? Remember what a nice moment that was? So many steps. Hi. Hi. Remember your first date? Remember the first time you held hands? These are all sweet memories that will turn against you the second you guys break up. Today we're going to talk about how to survive when this happens. This video is for the people out there who were fully committed to the relationship. Hey, want to do something this weekend? Uh, maybe. I, I think it'd be fun. <laughs> um, we'll see. The people who had their hearts trumped up. Hey, Sarah, just trying to get a hold of you again. It it it's been a few days. Just call me back when you can. The people who have been betrayed. Whoa, uh, who who's that that you're texting? Nobody. <laughs> Am I being paranoid? No, no, you're not. Okay, so first thing that you need to know is that the first 48 hours after you break up are literally the worst. You are going to feel more helpless, more hopeless than you have ever felt in your nice, comfortable, suburban life. You're going to feel empty, vulnerable. Broken. But that's normal, okay? It'll pass. I know that during those first 48 hours, it, it doesn't feel like it will, but it will. You don't know how in love I was! This is a different kind of pain! Your brain will adjust to this new reality, and eventually the pain will fade. But with that said, there will be trigger warnings. Things that come up in your life that remind you of the happy times that you shared with that special person. For example, you might have your music on shuffle one day, and a song plays that reminds you of yesteryear. So many steps. So few miles. That song is ruined, deleted from your life. And also be very careful about what songs you choose to listen to while you're dating. That can ruin some perfectly good music for you. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you and your significant other break up, you're putting your friends in an uncomfortable situation. Your friends didn't ask to be in the middle of this. They probably didn't even want you to date in the first place. Are, are you guys together now? Yes. We're totally in love. Isn't it wonderful? Oh yeah, this is gonna be real great. So when their prophecy ends up being fulfilled, it, it just makes things awkward. Hey, uh, do you wanna hang out tonight? Oh, I'm uh, I'm actually hanging out with Sarah tonight. Uh, but, but you're welcome to come if you want. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. But no matter how much you try to delay the inevitable, the day will come when you see your ex again. Hi. Hi. This is, it's gonna be tough, okay? But my advice is to play it cool. But, uh, not, not too cool. I've had, like, ten girlfriends, at least, since we broke up. If I'm being honest, I, I barely even remember you. My life is going great. 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 It's going great. 
No, no, no. Just be nice about it, okay? Ask a couple of polite questions and then be on your way. So, uh, how have you been doing? Oh, I've been... How are your parents been? Um, they're really Awesome. Good. Okay, well, I gotta run. See ya. Bye. <laughs> sure. That, that's fine, I guess. Hopefully running into your ex doesn't hurt as much as you were dreading that it, it would, you know, all those months. And if you're pleasantly surprised by that, congrats! You're well on your way to surviving the breakup. Just take it one day at a time and you'll find that it gets way easier as time passes. And then, one beautiful, magical day in the future. Oh! So many steps. No! No! I am not doing this again! You're all the same! You're all the same! Forget it! Well, these things take time. So maybe that'll help you in your times of uh, breakups. Maybe you've had one, maybe you will. Uh, and obviously we had some fun with that. Uh, and I know some of you actually have gone through some breakups that have been very hurtful, and I understand that. And a lot of times maybe you have walked away feeling unlovable, feeling like you don't deserve to be uh, around anyone, that you deserve to be alone, and that you maybe you think you're going to be alone for the rest of your life. Since one relationship didn't work, you've given up on all relationships. Maybe you haven't got there yet. I hope you don't, because the truth of the matter is um, there are lots of stories of people who had really bad breakups but ended up being happily married to someone later on that they look back and they see exactly why the breakup happened. And so uh, don't believe the lie that you're unlovable or that you're unworthy of being in a relationship. You're unworthy of other people because you had a, a bad breakup. Don't buy that lie. But even bigger than that, I don't want to talk about relationships and breakups all <laughs> for our lesson today. I'm going to talk about just feeling unlovable in life. Like feeling like you deserve to be alone. Feeling like you don't deserve love. That's the worst place you can be, and that's what fear wants to convince you of. Maybe it's because of th decisions you've made. Maybe it's because of the way you've been treated. You might feel like you don't deserve love and you deserve to be alone, but that's not the truth. You might feel that way, but that is not how to really think. Know what is really true, that God cares about you and loves you. We already talked about that in week one, and we're going to talk about it again today as we close our four-week series. So we're going to get into a story in a, just a moment, and it's basically the story of a, of a, of a bad breakup. Uh, this got some weird parts to it, and I'll explain it after we read it. But it's going to be, we're going to be looking at the people of Abraham. <clears throat> at that time, he's Abram, before his name has been changed, and Sarai, who is Sarah. Uh, remember Abraham and Sarah? God promised him a lot of things. Uh, he moved from his land to go to Canaan, and God promised him uh, a bla that he'd be a blessing to the whole world. We know that that would happen as Jesus would come from uh, Abraham's family that he was also going to have a land, which would be Canaan, and finally, that he was going to have a family that was going to be innumerable, uh, as many as the stars of the sky and, and, and grains of sand on the seashore. Abraham was going to be blessed with all these children, but there was one problem, if you remember. When God gives the promise to Abram and Sarai, uh, they're old. They're really old, and Sarai hasn't had any kids. And the promise has been made, and now... They're thinking, okay, it's time for us to have some kids. We don't have much time left. We don't have any time left. Sarah, Sarah, I can't have any kids right now. Abraham is too old. And so that's where we find ourselves in the story we're about to look at. <clears throat> and then we're going to be introduced to somebody named Hagar. And we're going to read in this passage that Hagar is a slave. Uh, but more likely, as we look at historic, historical context, uh, Hagar would have been Sarah's maidservant, which most likely would be somebody who, yes, was a servant and a slave, but even more than that would be a close confidant, someone that would always be right next to their master, right next to Sarai. Hagar would be one of the most trusted people in Sarah's life. Really, it would not have just been um, a master-slave uh, or employer-employee relationship. It would have been a friendship. And then what we're going to see happen in this story is going to lead us to this breakup. We're going to see that Hagar and Sarai uh, and Abram's in the middle of it. All of it's going to get really messy. And we're going to see Hagar is going to end up on the outside looking in. And if anybody had the right to feel unloved, it would be her at this point. So we're going to look at what happens. Then we're going to look at how God meets uh, ha uh, Hagar in her time of feeling unlovable. And hopefully that will teach us a few things about how we can feel about uh, our fear and especially thinking that we might be unlovable. So in Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 10, this is what we're going to read today. So follow along with me, listen along. Abram, Abram's wife Sarai had not borne him children. She owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. 
Sarai said to Abram, Since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps I can have children by her. And Abram agreed to do what Sarai said. So Abram's wife took, uh, Sarai took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife for him. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan for ten years. He slept with Hagar, and she became pregnant. When she realized that she was pregnant, she looked down on her mistress, and Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for my suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and ever since she saw that she was pregnant, she looked down on me. <clears throat> May the Lord judge between me and you. Abram replied to Sarai, Here, your slave is in your hands. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She replied, I am wanting a, running away from my mistress Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, You must go back to your mistress and submit to her mistreatment. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring, and they will be too many to count. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, You have conceived and will have a son. You will name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. He will live at odds with all his brothers. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, the God who sees. For she said, Have I really seen the one who sees me? That is why she named the spring a well of the living one who sees me. It is located between Kadesh and Barid. All right, so what we see here uh, is pretty uh, clear. Um, so Abram and Sarai try to help God out. And that's really what they try to do. And, uh, and their plan, this is Sarai's plan, is to have Hagar get pregnant with Abram's child so that the family could come from that child. She didn't believe that she could have children anymore. She believed that God uh, didn't want her to have children anymore any, either. And so uh, we see this happen, and then immediately Sarai regrets her decision because Hagar does get pregnant, and now all of a sudden Sarai is jealous. She's inflamed with jealousy. She, she's upset with Hagar because Hagar has what Sarai wants, a child. And so she gets upset with her, her slave, her handmaiden, her, her friend, and basically just starts abusing her, starts mistreating her, starts treating her with anger and hatred, and so much so that Hagar runs away. Uh, later on, when all this is said and done, uh, Hagar and her son Ishmael, who would be born to her, are going to be shunned and, and put out away from Abram and Sarah, uh, and they're going to live at odds with the family of Abram for the rest of uh, history. Uh, and we know that that's going to happen. But right now, at this point, we see that Sarai has changed her mind. She's upset uh, with Hagar. And now we see this whole thing happen. And you know Hagar, at this point, is feeling unloved. She did what her mistress asked her to do. But when she got pregnant, she probably did feel a little pride, like, how I can get pregnant, you can't. And Sarai didn't like that. And so now there's this conflict, and there's almost like this breakup, and she's, she runs away. And so she's feeling unloved at this moment. Uh, and then we see that God at this moment comes to Hagar. Now keep in mind, this wasn't God's ideal plan. Uh, what He didn't want Abraham and Sarah, he didn't want a Abraham and Sarai to decide that uh, God wasn't going to be able to get Sarai pregnant and to do this on their own. Uh, so really, Hagar is a result of Abram's disobedience. And so the son from Hagar would be a result of Abram's disobedience. And so God could have just let them run, not worry about it, and Hagar could have continued to feel unloved and unworthy and not worth anything and just kept running. But God didn't do that. God comes to Hagar and he, he tells her, look, I'm going to give you, I'm going to multiply your offspring as many as there will be too many to count. Basically, he says, I'm going to give you the same thing that I promised Abram. I'm going to give you all these descendants. Now, he doesn't promise blessing for the world and he doesn't promise a land, but he does promise descendants. Uh, and then there's this whole idea uh, that Ishmael is going to be born. Because God has heard her cry of affliction. God has seen Hagar. God knows Hagar. He knows how she feels. And he is visiting her and telling her, look, there's hope for you. There's a promise that I'm going to give you because you still matter. And you still, I love you and I see you. And that idea of being seen, Hagar understands. And even in this, we understand there's going to be conflict between uh, him and the brothers who would be Israel and uh, Arab nations. And we see that that's going to happen. But uh, then we see... 
how Hagar responds. She names the Lord the God who sees. For she understood that she saw the one who really saw her. Uh, this, is, this is Hagar experiencing God at a time when she feels unlovable and unseen. When she feels like she deserves to be alone. When she feels like life has just put her in a place where she is unworthy. And then she realizes that God sees her. God knows her. That's the idea. It's not just that he sees her with his eyes, but he knows her. He heard her cry. He sees her. He knows her. And because he knows her, he's going to love her, and he tells her to go back. And this is just an understanding as we look at this story. Someone who feels unloved feels like they've been put out, that everyone in their life has abandoned them. And he, not only does she feel lonely, but she's feeling deserving of being lonely. She's not a prom she's not part of the covenant that God had made with Abram. That was for between God, Abram, and Sarai. But yet God says, Look, I'm gonna bless you, I see you, I know what you're going through, and I'm here to see you through. Uh, and that is what we see happen. We see God who loves someone so deeply that even though I, from the outside looking in, maybe she wasn't the one that was supposed to be in this position. But God sees her, God knows her, and God helps her. And here's the thing that we can think about as we talk about the change up of fear. We want to change up our saying from I'm not worth it to he says I'm worth it. From moving from I'm not to he is. In other words, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable to move to say but he loves me anyway, but he sees me. Move from saying, I'm not known, to I am known. That's what we can trust and know. That our fear cannot control us to think that we are unknown or unloved. Because God knows us, he loves us, and he sees us. So you can trust that even during this time. When fear is trying to tell you that you're alone and you deserve it, or you're unlovable. Don't buy the lie. Because if you buy that lie, then you're going to destroy your life because you don't see God for who he really is. A God who loves you, cares about you, sees you, and is always involved in your life. You need to trust him. That is what we are called to do. We've seen in this series that fear can be very deceptive. It can sneak up on us. It can fool us. It can trick us. And it continues today. Fear that we feel of anything can convince us that we are unlovable, unworthy, and don't really deserve to even be around. That is a lie from Satan. That is a lie that we cannot believe. Not only, like we looked at last week, is God with you and other people are alongside you. That is very true. But also, God sees you, knows you, and loves you no matter where you find yourself. No matter how unlovable you feel, it's not true. You're not unlovable. You're not a lost cause. God loves you, sees you, and cares for you just like he did for Hagar and so many others in the scriptures, in the Bible. We know that God cares about us. So it goes all the way back to week one, that we think about when, when fear has tried to steal anything from us, joy or confidence, all of these things, and saying that we're not worth it. We run back to God's love. We can't stop. Go in, we need to go back to that. We talked about that week one. We talk about it again today. Run to God's love because he loves you, he knows you, he sees you, he cares for you. You can trust in that. And he is the one that can take fear that we feel and say, turn it upside down and say, no, fear is not going to control you. Be controlled by my love, be controlled by my care, and know that I see you no matter what. This is God's perfect love, and it was ultimately shown through Jesus. Think about that. Jesus loves you enough so that when you feel unlovable or unworthy, Jesus loved you and saw you as worthy so much that he gave his own life. He suffered a death that no one should have to suffer. He took your sins and my sins uh, when he died on the cross, that if we just come to him in faith and we ask him for salvation and we turn to him and turn away from ourselves, that we can have salvation and that we can mean something to uh, him, mean something to the world because he loves us so much he gave us Jesus to die for us and rise again and give us new life. We don't live the new life that he's given us when we believe that we're unlovable. Because when we believe that we're unlovable, we are doubting that God loves us. We forget what God has done. We forget who God is. We can't do that. Guys, during this time, be very careful not to buy the lie. 
not to fall into sin because the world or Satan, your own desires, tell you that somehow you're not worth it or you're not good enough uh, or you're too afraid to do anything. That's None of that's true. What's true is that God loves you. He will work through you and in you if you just let him. And so guys, don't fall for the lie and don't be depressed by a breakup. Don't be depressed by anything that happens in this world that tries to tell you that you're not worth it because God says you are. He created you just the way you are. He created you perfectly in his mind and his heart. And he loves you and cares for you because he sees you. And you can trust that each and every day. So here's just some closing thoughts uh, as we close this series, as we close this lesson. I'm going to give you a statement a question. And I'm going to give you an answer. I want you to consider these things. Are you feeling guilty because you've done something shameful? Remember that you're loved. Are you feeling angry because life's not the way you want it to be? Remember that you're loved. Feeling sad because no one seems to care about you? Remember that you're loved by God. Are you feeling scared because you don't know who to trust? Remember you're loved by God and you can trust him. Remember, God created us and loved us. No matter what anyone says or does, no matter what tricks fear might try to use to scare us away from his love, his love is always there. His love is secure. It can drive out every fear. It can drive out every deception that fear tries to put in our way. And we can experience his love and we can also share his love with others. So with all of that we've talked about over the last four weeks, don't let fear control you. Let him control you. Run to God. Come to him in prayer, read his word, ask him to show you his love because he's there, he sees you. Don't ever feel like God isn't there, that God doesn't see what's going on. God doesn't know how you feel. He knows everything. And even though he knows you, now keep this in mind. I'll close on this thought. He knows us fully, but even knowing us, loves us fully. I've heard it said before, um, a lot of people might know us, uh, a lot of people might love us, but very few people know us and love us. There's only a few people that do. But God knows everything about us, our failures, our fears, our problems, our, our insecurities, our weaknesses. He knows everything about us. He knows the deepest, darkest part of us. He knows all of that. And despite that, he loves us anyway. So not only are we fully known by God, but we are fully loved. That is a beautiful thing that we can hold on to. To know that when we fear that we are fully known and fully loved. Keep that in your mind today as uh, you go through your time. And I'm actually going to close with a music video that has to do with this idea of being fully known and fully loved at the same time. So watch this music video and listen to the words, and hopefully it will encourage you this week. Uh, before we watch the video, let's close in prayer, and then you can watch that video as we leave. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the reminder that we are always loved even when we don't feel we are. God, help us not to fall for the lie that fear is teaching us that somehow we deserve to be alone or we are unworthy. Thank you for seeing us and caring for us every, every day and in every situation. Help us to trust you and love you. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you on the Zoom. Oh, by the way, sorry, forgot this. Code word for today. Uh, look back in the Bible in Genesis chapter 16. And I want you to look at verse 15 and 16. And tell me how old Abram was when Ishmael was born. Okay, so how old was Abraham when Ishmael was born? We didn't read that today, but once again, Genesis chapter 16, you're going to be looking in verse 16. So Genesis 16, 16, how old was Abram when Ishmael was born? You tell me that number, and when we're in the Zoom, and you'll be entered for the gift card. We'll see you then, guys. Thanks. Thanks.